So my career as a terrorist started already at the age of two. My father, you see, was smart enough that he, as a Palestinian physics professor, signed a symbolic peace treaty along with 11 Palestinian and 12 Israeli intellectuals. Smart move, huh? Well, upon which the Israeli occupation forces, oh, sorry for that, the Israeli defense forces arrested him in order to be later sent into exile. This is a petition signed by 1,300 physics professors in the United States against his, him being sent to exile. However, how did I step in as the terrorist? I was actually sneaking very dangerous products to him into prison. How? I was sneaking them in my diaper. So I was actually sneaking in nail clippers, bonbons, letters, you name it. Quite dangerous. I'm not a terrorist anymore. I'm not sneaking items in my life anymore. I'm a dancer. Started a dance project in Palestine two years ago to fight social fragmentation and a mean of fighting social development obstacles such as inequality, stereotypes, prejudice. So this is, for example, you can see the awareness campaign we launched as part of the performance where we just worked with 200 children focused on street children, fighting the phenomena of child labor. Um, we are training trainers in Palestine. We don't believe in exporting people the whole time. So our trainers will be learning how to work not only with children, but how to work with violated women, how to work with people differently abled, mainstream called handicap, I prefer differently abled, and how to help the society develop. So people often ask me like, yeah, how come you started this? And I would be only lying to you to make up any reason and to tell you I knew why. It was a hunch, it was a feeling, and one thing led to the other. Some possibilities presented themselves and there I was. There I was on the way of fighting my own trauma. My own trauma as a child and my trauma later on as a woman growing up in a society where the oppressed becomes the oppressor, where men oppress women. I am sick and tired of being looked at as a commodity. And my hope is that through this project, women would not be looked at as a commodity anymore. You know, this fact of me basing my decision upon a feeling, I would have dis been discredited a couple of years ago. Men often discredit women for their decision ability because they base their decisions upon feelings. Today, science tells us better. Today, we know that the part of the brain that makes decision is the limbic brain. The limbic brain does not understand language nor reason. The only thing the limbic brain understands is emotions, upon which I base all of my feelings. And here I want to go back to my trauma. People, I am not a victim. And I refuse to be labeled as one or put in that box. I recognize the trauma. And I ask myself, what caused it? And what caused it is violence. Violence in both forms. Verbal violence and physical violence. I'd like to ask you, do you know what this is? This is an experiment done by Dr. Isaro Imoto. These are two jars of water where he recited love words to the one and hate words to the other. And that's how the crystals were formed. As a dancer, knowing that my body consists of 70% water, I look at this and think, wow, can you visualize all those hate words, the hate messages news channel distribute do to us? And then I think for a second, all those children shows, the violence in there, which takes me back to science again, 
you know, my father is a physics professor. I like science a bit, even as an artist. Dr. Giacomo Rizzolatti discovered the mirror neurons. You know, me scratching my hand now, your brains are actually sending a message to your hand, asking your hand, is it being scratched, just by watching me scratch my hand. And your hand is sending a message back saying, hey, no, it's not me, it's someone else. So if I place your hand under an aesthetics, your brain will actually feel the scratching. You will actually feel it. So just think about the violence being produced every day, everything you watch. Think about that. It makes you, watching that, part of it. It makes you more susceptible to violence. So, vicious circle. We have the violence, the violence leading to trauma, the trauma leading to post-traumatic stress disorders, the stress disorders leading back to violence. Vicious circle. How do I get out? Science, again, shows us that there's something beautiful possible out of trauma, which is post-traumatic growth. And yes, I mean it, growth, not, this, not any stress disorder. How do I achieve post-traumatic growth? It's very easy, extremely easy. There are four resiliences that you need to strengthen each human to achieve that. Physical resilience, mental resilience, emotional resilience, and cognitive resilience. Has anyone in this room ever danced a waltz? Know how to waltz? I'd like to take a step up for a sec. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. Okay. Well, the reason I chose waltz is easy. It's copyrights. You know, if I chose salsa, it's salsa music, and then someone would have to dance salsa with me, and we'd have to pay lots of money for the video. <laughs> so I would have sticked to waltz, not because I live in Vienna and that's what you do there, but because it's easier with the music. So. I, you imagine me now dancing a waltz with someone on the stage. <laughs> that would have been the dancing. Where we... So if you see two people dancing, try to imagine that. Not necessarily two people, just a party, people dancing. We already have the physical resilience, we're moving. I think that's easy to understand. We have the cognitive resilience because People have to keep the count, they have to listen to the music, you have to really get the cues if you're going on stage with that. So you're training the cognitive resilience, you're training the social resilience, because usually we do dance in good groups, and at the same time, you are training the emotional resilience. Often people don't realize why the emotional. The answer is these pictures you're seeing where those children dance to a topic they really care about. For example, the last performance, it was about exile. The experience of exile, not only the Palestinian exile, but even the African exile. For them to broaden their horizons, and it is emotional. And even if the topic is not emotional, you know, being in a physical contact with any human for just six seconds, your body starts to produce the hormone of oxytocin. That is the hormone of what must happen. It is the hormone being produced when women are at labor. So we have strengthened all resiliences. The sad part of the project is how people always react to it. People come up to me and say, wow, that's such a great peace project. It's remarkable how you're bringing Palestinians and Israelis together. Pause. Think. Reflect. Did I mention that? It makes me reflect back on how peace has been labeled in that region of the world. If you want to do anything where you use the term peace, then you have to be bringing Palestinians and Israelis together. We forgot about the healing process of peace for us as humans. But what's actually tearing me apart is the polarization. Bringing Palestinians together versus not bringing them together. A demon versus an angel, the good versus the bad. Being pro, being against. My peace does not know polarity. And I refuse 
to take any standing. I'm a human. Who am I to indoctrinate on anyone, any Palestinian or Israeli, whether to work together or not to work together? This is a peace project. It's a project about finding the peace within you, finding the peace, connecting to your body, connecting to your feminine side. It's about finding peace in your first direct surrounding, finding peace at home. It's a project about feeling the empathy, receiving the empathy, and giving the empathy. And here I'd just like to do a small, short excursion. You know, if we reflect back for a second on the post-Oslo so-called peace process, there were enough projects, Palestinians and Israelis coming together, you know, dancing together, being photographed together. Everything seemed fine. Two weeks later, each went home to the fact of being occupier and occupied, and nothing changed on the ground. What we do here is different. Here, we experience peace. And I think each and every single human, if they experience that within themselves once, then they will wake up every morning, say, I want to live in a place where there's no violence. I want to live in a place where women are respected, where they're not looked at as commodities. I want to live in a place of harmony. They will stand there and keep their arm stretched out no matter what the difficulties are and say, I want peace because I need it. Not because of you, because I want it, I need it.